Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be talking about how to use a Strong's Concordance. Uh, before we begin, let me back up and just say uh, just a bit about word studies. And I think word studies are good. Uh, words are important. They have meaning. But sometimes you can have multiple meanings for the same word. Take the example of the word trunk. It can be the central part of a tree. It can be uh, something uh, a man wears to go swimming, his swimming trunks. Uh, it can be the proboscis of an elephant. It can be the back of your car. It can be a suitcase. Each of these is a legitimate use of the word trunk, uh, but don't confuse the meanings. The context will tell you which it is. There's also what we call the etymological fallacy. Uh, and when we speak of etymology, that's how the word came to be. And words are more than just the sum of their parts or the history of those words. For example, a butterfly has nothing to do with flies or with butter. Um, and yet here's, here's two parts of the word that were joined together to make one word. And it has an independent meaning. Next, we can have the exegetical fallacy in which the original meanings do not govern the meaning of that word in later texts, so that you can have a, uh, for example, I can talk about having a pregnant pause, and the word pregnant has a meaning, <laughs> uh, but when I put it together, it's a figure of speech that says uh, there's something sort of, uh, I'm actually pausing in order to make a, like a, a verbal and oral point. And so uh, uh, I'm using that word pregnant in a way that's other than its usual meaning, and that's appropriate. Uh, Greek words that have later derived English meanings are not governed by those meanings. <laughs> the classical example is uh, Paul when he says uh, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. And somebody used a, a concordance and they found out that the Greek word there, uh, uh, the word for power, uh, dunamis, it's the same uh, word from which we eventually get our word dynamite. And so people say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God. It's the dynamite of God. And that, that makes for a nice sermon. Uh, it, it's really not very accurate though. You see that that same term, dunamis, is used over in Revelation chapter 18, verse 3. Uh, this is uh, describing the fall of the, that great city, uh, Babylon. And the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth, notice that's dunamis again, of her sensuality. We don't say the dynamite of her sensuality. That wouldn't make any sense at all. Uh, so we have to be careful about uh, those misuses of, of exegesis and of Greek, word, Greek words. Now, let's get to our topic. Uh, and for this illustration, I'm going to use uh, the strongest NIV exhaustive concordance. Uh, uh, I have that, and I've got some much older ones that are keyed to the King James Version. This one happens to be keyed to the NIV. So I'm just going to use this as an, as an example. They both do the same thing, they're, but they're always keyed to a specific translation. Now, in this case, we're looking at the word baptize, and, and what it has is every word that's in the Bible, in that translation, uh, you, you have them in alphabetical order. So you just look up the word baptism under B's. Um, and then it gives you all the places from Matthew. This is a New Testament. The word baptize is never used in the Old Testament. Uh, Matthew all the way down to 1 Corinthians, and it gives you every single uh, place. Notice the first example, uh, Matthew 3, 11, I, and then it just puts the word B because it's the word baptize there. I baptize you with water for repentance. But then look over to the right, and there on the right you see a number. Now this one's going to this example is going to be easy because every time the word baptize, baptize is used as a verb, uh, it's always that same Greek word nine sixty six. And then I go to the Greek part. Don't confuse the Hebrew with the Greek. You can make some silly mistakes there. But you go to the the Greek section and you look up that number. Let's do that. Here we are nine sixty six. And there, there we are. And now we find that it is the word baptizo. I have the lexical form of the Greek word. Now, when I actually look it up in a Greek New Testament, it, it might look different because instead of baptizo, it might be uh, uh, baptizain or baptizoma, depending on if it's I baptize or you baptize or, or we baptize or uh, it might be a, a different tense. And the, so the form of the word might look different in a Greek New Testament, but this is what's called the lexical form before you've added any modifiers to it. 
next you have the lexical form transliterated. So that way, if you if you look at the, the Greek letters and you say, oh, I don't know what those mean. Now you have an English rendition of that Greek word. Next, you have the part of speech. This is telling you it's V for verb. It might say noun. It might be adjective and so on. Then you have a frequency count. This is how many times that Greek word is used in, again, uh, in the New Testament. The New Testament is going to be Greek. Old Testament is going to he be Hebrew. Then you have the root word. Now, a root word can be a little dangerous because it might not really, uh, even though that's where the word came from, it might be connected to that. But roots can sometimes, like I take, took the example of butterfly. It's not really about butter or flies. Um, it's, it's a separate word. And so just because it has a root word doesn't mean it has that, that uh, meaning. But notice it gives you, again, the number for the root word. And uh, down at the bottom, we looked up 970. And that was the root uh, bapto, which means to, to dip. Um, it has that, that sort of basic, uh, basic meaning. Next, I have the definition of the word, a basic definition. Notice to baptize, wash, and uh, depending on the context, it can refer to the one baptizing. So it says the, the baptizer. Um, so it can be, even though it's a, it's a verb, it can be used uh, actually as an adverb that, that actually then describes the, the one doing the action. Now, this is the, the part where a lot of people get it wrong. Um, it's giving us the, the basic definition. But what follows, and in this edition, it follows with the same text. In, in my old, uh, King, in my old uh, Strong's and Chords, it's key to the King James. It gives those first in regular text, and now it gives these various ways that it's translated in italic. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in regular text, uh, the definition was on italics. This edition doesn't do that, which is probably not very helpful. But it, what it's giving me is the various ways it's translated in the NIV, whether that's an exact translation or not. Sometimes I can have figures of speech, um, uh, but it's all the ways that it's translated. Now, as I said, that doesn't account for figures of speech. And figures of speech, can, when I'm doing a word study, can lead me in some rather humorous directions. You see, you have, for example, I'm taking uh, the example from the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, where God says, for in the day you eat from it, you will surely die. If I look that up in the Hebrew, literally, it would say, for in the day you eat from it, dying, you will die. And you say, oh, that must be speaking about two different deaths, a physical death and a spiritual death. No, that's not what it says at all. Um, I've actually heard pastors say that sort of thing. They, they have just a little bit of Hebrew, but uh, not enough to really understand what it's saying. In Hebrew, there's a figure of speech. When you want to say um, that something's really going to happen, you, you say it twice. Um, that, that's oversimplifying. it. I don't want to get into a, a more difficult explanation. But... Uh, when it says in the Hebrew, die and you will die, what it really means is the way they've translated it here. You will surely, or you will certainly, or you're really going to die. It's really going to happen. And so uh, that's, it's that figure of speech that communicates that. Now, idioms and figures of speech, we have those in English. Uh, think about uh, the term bite the bullet. <laughs> it doesn't mean a, uh, that you're biting something or that, that somebody's shooting. Uh, it's a figure of speech that says you're going to have to face up to reality. Uh, or it's raining cats and dogs. It does not mean literally that cats and, and canines are going plop, plop, plop outside. It means it's really raining hard. Uh, to beat around the bush is the idea to, to avoid coming to the point. Um, but it's not about bushes or beating anything. Uh, to call it a day, it, it doesn't mean defining words. It means uh, I'm, I'm finishing up this project and I'm, I'm going to finish uh, at least for the day. Uh, or here's one that actually tr does translate a sort of into Hebrew. Uh, when you talk about he's pulling my leg, it means he's trying to, to joke with me. He's tricking me. Uh, and in Hebrew, you actually have a phrase that's like that. You yakub someone. You, you literally in, in Hebrew, it says you, you heal them. You, you uh, pull on their heel. Uh, but what it means is you're deceiving them. Now, let's look at a, an example from the um, from the Bible, uh, the King James Version in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 6, uh, eat thou not the bread of him that hath, and our f the figure I want to look at is that figure, an evil eye. Oh my goodness, what is an evil eye? And then it goes on, neither desire thou his dainty meats. And, the, and, and actually the context goes on from there. Um, now that term, an evil eye, ra uh, ayan, 
Uh, Ra is the word for evil. <laughs> Ayin is the word for eye. So uh, the King James has literally translated it. But that's not really what it means. If I look, and I'm going to take the New American Standard, and the New American Standard is usually quite literal too, except when the meaning is lost by it. And so notice here, instead they've translated, do not eat the bread of a, and they've rendered it, a selfish man or desire his delicacies. And an evil eye it was a figure of speech to describe somebody who was stingy or selfish. Now, we have the opposite of that, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 9. He who is generous, and, and now I am in the New American Standard, he who is generous uh, will be blessed. And again, that word generous, uh, it's, it's tov ayin hu. Uh, tov is the word for good. <laughs> he who has a good eye, if I wanted to be literal, and that's how the King James did. Uh, actually, the King James gave you the, the idea. They did not translate it literally. That's, that's fortunate. Uh, he, he, who ha, he that hath a bountiful eye, the same thing as being generous. Uh, so they've actually done a good job here. They, they did not go overly literal. They did render the figure of speech. Nice job, King James. Uh, let me just say for the record, I like the King James in the Old Testament. Uh, sometimes overly literal, but I still like the King James for the Old Testament. Now, there's a figure, that figure of speech is communicated in the New Testament. This is where the point I want to close on. Uh, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, and he's been talking about uh, um, don't, don't be after the wealth of the world and don't uh, uh, worry about how am I going to pay for my bills and uh, what shall I wear and what shall I eat and things like that. Uh, he's talking about uh, finances. And then in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, if you're, if you're not aware of the figure of speech, you might actually think, oh my goodness, he changed, he changed subjects. And he, he really hasn't. Um, because remember, the way you talked about being uh, generous or being stingy is to have an evil eye or a good eye. And it's in that context that Jesus says, uh, the, eye of the, uh, the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. Now, now um, in English, you say, well, that's a different topic. No, he's, he's taking that figure of speech and building on it. But if your eye is bad, remember, that's a figure of speech. Eye is bad means you're, if you're stingy. Uh, but notice how he's applied it in a slightly larger way. You know, what are you worried about? What sort of things are you concerned? Uh, if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of of darkness, if then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And so he, he takes the figure of speech, stretches a bit, and he he gives it a, a new emphasis. It still has that idea of, of stinginess, but see, that becomes a way of looking at how is your heart in dealing with heavenly things. And so you have to get that bigger picture.